I've been in the industry about 35, 36 years. I've worked for a lot of the top PCB fab shops in Europe and North America. And in that time, I've headed up uh, process engineering, quality, field apps. I currently serve on the IPC Technical Council. And also, I'm on multiple IPC committees. Um, so I'm currently in the process of teaching North America designers about build-up materials, high rail, and how to design thinner boards uh, using low CT non-reinforced materials. I'll talk a little bit about them today. So I'm going to try and cover as much as possible. Uh, Lucy asked me to do 10 things, and uh, I probably come up with about 50 different uh, things to consider when you're looking at a PCB material. Um, so yeah, we plan to do a second webinar to cover anything I don't get to. I don't think I'll have time today to talk about rigid flex materials or RF. So we're primarily going to talk about uh, digital and high speed type uh, product. Um, so when I was putting this together, <clears throat> I thought that I'd do it from a fabricator perspective or from a designer. So we're going to sort of think about it as a design engineer, and then we'll see how the, the fabricator views um, what the design engineers actually tell them, okay? So the first thing, and not a bad place to start, is um, the designer's going to basically look at um, a data sheet. So he's going to have a, a rough idea of, of what he actually wants, so he's going to pull up different data sheets and compare them. So he's going to look at things like the TG, um, the decomp temperature, uh, T sub D. Uh, if there's impedance or signal integrity, he's going to obviously look at the dielectric constant and the DF. Uh, he may be interested in other properties with the material itself. He may uh, be interested in what the maximum operating temperature is, uh, what the moisture absorption, uh, and really the designer knows where the product's going. So in probably 60, 70% of cases where it's not going into a harsh environment, uh, there's no signal and integrity, um, the designer really can't go wrong. It's when he wants to do something more with the board, the design, or the environment that's going into, he must start looking at other things that actually affect the design um, and the material that he's actually selecting for that product, okay? Now, the one thing you will see on the right-hand side is typical values. You'll see there's one single number, okay? Um, I'm going to come back to this when we talk about DK and DF, but there isn't a single number uh, for some of these properties. It's just a typical average value that's taken for that material itself. The second thing is the designer must make sure he's looking at apples and apples, Okay. If you look at laminate B and laminate C um, or laminate A, you must make sure that if you're looking at uh, things like TG, that you're looking at the same way it's been measured. If it's a TMA or a DSC type measurement, make sure when you look at it one compared to the other, that it's, it's the exact same uh, measurement. Uh, the other thing a designer doesn't know uh, would be the typical resin content um, from the fabricator. Uh, and that depends on the glass cloth style. Uh, I'm not going to how the material is actually manufactured, uh, but a lot of different types of glass cloth will have much different resin contents. And even though um, some of these materials have a typical value, we can actually supply some of these materials at a lower and a much higher resin content when requested. Other things to look at is X and Y in the CTE. Uh, we'll talk about that later, which is uh, key during the assembly process and what the Z-axis expansion is. And we'll talk more about that, how that is actually going to affect the reliability of the product itself. So within the actual laminate itself, the foil is going to affect the electric circuit, the signal. Uh, it's going to be used for ground plane. Um, and in some cases, it might be used for heat dissipation. Uh, the different types of glass cloth will have different stiffness. They'll have different levels of dimensional stability. Um, some are low CTE. Uh, it could help with low warpage. 
uh, low decay, and obviously the modulus, the resin itself. Uh, so we modify the resins or put fillers into the resins to, to basically modify them uh, to perform better electrically or to perform better thermally um, or to reduce the CT. So it's also used for heat dissipation. Uh, there is resin system out there. They're purely designed uh, to dissipate heat. Uh, some have lower or higher uh, moisture or water absorption. For instance, uh, polyamide is a very hydroscopic material and fabricators have to basically desiccate, desiccate the prepregs and bake the cores to get as much of that moisture out of the material uh, before they actually laminate it together. Uh, the flammability rating, uh, the MOT, is it a 130 MOT or a 155? Um, different coppers uh, have different peel strengths to the resin. Um, and obviously that resin would affect the TG, the toughness. And obviously, depending on what type of filler we put in there, and even the glass uh, will affect the dielectric properties themselves. A lot of the fillers we use are for heat resistance, flammability, stiffness, warpage, modulus, um, and basically loss of the material. Again, heat dissipation, CT. So depending on what the, in the ideal world, I would give the designer everything, the, the lowest CTE, the, the most, you know, thermally conductive and the best electrical properties. But unfortunately, some of these fillers act against each other. So uh, we can't give you the best electrical and the best um, thermally conductive materials just based uh, on the different types of filler. Some of the thermally conductive materials will have up to an 85% filler content. So they're pretty fragile. And a lot of those thermally conductive materials, because they're so fragile, fabricators are unable to handle them as a B.